Radio is all about sine waves in one form or another. We know that when we send a radio frequency sine wave to an antenna, it radiates and other stations can pick it up. That's totally fundamental to radio. But where do these sine waves come from? The answer, an oscillator. Let's dig down inside a simple working oscillator and see how it works. Welcome to Ask Dave, episode 45. I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, here to answer your questions about radio and electronics. This is Ask Dave, episode number 45, and today we explore oscillators. Oscillators build on a couple principles of nature. The key concept is that of resonance, and it works both electronically and physically. The way pendulum clocks work is that at the end of every pendulum cycle, the clock gives a precisely timed nudge to keep the pendulum swinging. The pendulum swings back and forth at a rate that pretty much depends only on the pendulum's length and center of mass. A longer pendulum takes longer to complete a cycle. So, the key takeaway is this. Things have a frequency at which they like to oscillate or go back and forth. We call that the natural frequency. Now, let's look at it electronically. We'll start with an amplifier as shown in this diagram. Then we need to feed back a little of the output into the input. Depending on the reactance of the feedback, the oscillator will oscillate at its natural frequency. If we do it right, we get a nice sine wave. Rather than show more diagrams, let's demonstrate with real electronics. First, to build an experimental circuit, we need something called a breadboard. Many years ago, when hams wanted to try different circuits, they'd construct them on literal breadboards, which you really don't see anymore. Things have become rather easier, though, with the advent of this type of breadboard. Let me show you how it works. Each hole is something you can stick a wire into, and it'll handle different sizes of wires very nicely. Now, look at this photograph. All the pins in any given row are connected together. So, if you need to connect up to five things together, just put one pin of each into a row. Now, look at these holes on each edge. These are connected together vertically. The red set of holes is for the positive power supply. Similarly, the black is for the negative. I'll demonstrate here by putting a couple components on a breadboard. Okay, now we want to connect this to this, so we use one of the many wires that come with the breadboard. Plug them in the same row, just like this, and they're connected. Now, some components won't fit into a breadboard, so we use clip leads. These breadboards are available quite inexpensively on Amazon. I'll put a link in the text accompanying this video. Second, I want to introduce you to a fascinating offer from the ARRL. Every month, Ward Silver N0AX has a column in QST called Hands-On Radio. He's got lots of little circuits to build to help understand electronics, especially radio-related electronics. But what's cool is that the League has gathered about 120 of these into a couple books, Volume 1 and 2 of ARRL's Hands-On Radio Experiments. That's nice enough, but the League also offers a handy parts kit that has everything you need for all the experiments in the two books. What a treasure trove here. I'll put the link for this in the text accompanying this video. Now, let's look at the experiment setup. We're going to use Hands-On Radio Experiment 17. Here's the schematic from the book. The basic element is a number 741 op amp, an analog amplifier. Op amps have positive inputs that lead to positive outputs and a negative input that gives an inversion of the signal on the output. So if the signal on the inverting input, pin 2, goes positive, the output, pin 6, goes negative. Flipping a signal like this imparts a 180 degree phase shift. But to have an oscillator, we need a signal that's in phase. 
So to add 180 degrees more phase shift to get 360 degrees, what we do is use the phase shift network shown here as the feedback network. Now remember that 180 plus 180 is 360, which is a complete revolution. So we're essentially back where we started. So we're sending a signal that's in phase back into the oscillator. Now this network will shift to signals phase, and then the signal is fed back into the inverting input. Now, and here's the important point. The amount of phase shift from the network depends on frequency as we suspect it might because of the capacitance which provides reactance and the reactance of a capacitor or inductor changes with frequency. But, and as I said earlier, there's a natural frequency at work here. There is only one frequency at which the phase shift network will create a 180 degree phase shift or 60 degrees per section. So if we feed the output of the phase shift network back into the inverting input, we have 180 degrees from the amplifier itself and an additional 180 degrees from the phase shift network. And thus we have a full 360 degrees at the circuit's natural frequency. Thus, if the amplifier has enough gain, the circuit will oscillate. The gain of the op amp amplifier is determined by the 10 kilo ohm resistor here and the variable resistor or potentiometer here. So here's our experimental setup. You'll see an oscilloscope, a power source, and the breadboard with some components on it. I've divided the circuit up into two parts, the op amp segment down here and the phase shifting segment to the right. The output of the oscillator is this white wire here, which is connected to this yellow wire or point A on the schematic. Now, if you adjust the potentiometer so the gain is too low to sustain oscillation, nothing happens. If there's too much gain, the op amp goes crazy trying to follow the feedback. But if it's just right, you get a nice, sine wave output, shown as the yellow trace on the oscilloscope. The output of the amplifier is what you're seeing on the scope, and it's also what's fed into the phase shift network. Now, as I mentioned, the phase shift network is in three segments, each of which shifts the signal by 60 degrees. Let's check and see if that's true. Using a second channel on the oscilloscope, let's tap the signal after the first section or at point B. The shifted signal is shown in blue, actually cyan. We take a snapshot for convenience. So the yellow is the output of the oscillator. The built-in frequency counter shows the frequency at about 518 hertz. Sometimes it's easier to look at scope traces in a video with the colors inverted. Let's do that. So what was the yellow trace is now blue. Let's count how long a half cycle of the oscillator waveform is based on the oscillator output. That's the distance from here to here, which is 180 degrees, about 10 vertical marks, with each mark being 50 microseconds. Now, Let's look at the phasing network. We're taking the signal at point B on the schematic, which shows up as the red line. If the entire phase shifter gives a 180 degree phase shift, just one third of it ought to give about 60 degrees. So here the red signal shifted from the blue by about three and a third marks or one third of 180 degrees or 60 degrees. Hey, this stuff really works. Now let's look at point C, which is the next phase shift delay. We see that the red signal is delayed by six and a half or close to 120 degrees. And now let's look at point D at the output of the phase delay network. <laughs> no need to count here. We see that the phase network output is about 180 degrees out from point A. So this is the feedback into the op amp to complete the 360 degrees necessary for oscillation. Okay, to reiterate, the amplifier, this little black IC here, inverts the signal which comes out on the yellow wire. 
That's 180 degrees of our required 360 degrees of phase shift. Then this phase shift network adds another 180 degrees of phase shift, which is output on the green wire and goes back into the op amp into the inverting input. Of course, 360 degrees is electronically equivalent to zero degrees, so our feedback signal is in phase with the input and therefore the circuit exhibits positive feedback and can oscillate. So, what did we learn from this experiment? First, an analog oscillator requires some sort of positive feedback. That means feedback that's in phase with the input. Second, the frequency determining element, in this case the phase shift network, coupled with the op amp has a natural frequency at which it likes to be resonant. Third, too much or too little feedback will keep the oscillator from working properly. Now, there are many kinds of analog oscillators, and in future Ask Day videos, we'll explore some of them, including the, <laughs> the famous Hartley and Culpitz. So, there you have it. Oscillators explained. Please click on the YouTube like symbol if you enjoyed this video, and please also feel free to share it with your friends. Subscribe by clicking on the picture of my face, I think it's right here, with subscribe written on my forehead, and that way you'll get notification of upcoming videos. If you feel so inclined, there's a tip jar right here as well as a link to the Ask Dave playlist. Happy experimenting. Until next time, 73.